friends, and welcome to All By My Shelf. I'm Miss Rachel, and it's so nice to see you. Today's panel is Build a Book Workshop, Stuffed with Fluff by Design. Five incredible young adult authors are here to tell you all about what fluff means when we're talking about books and why happy books shouldn't be looked down upon. Our panelists today are Jamie Pacton, Nandini Bajpai, Lauren Morrill, Marissa Cantor, and Jacqueline Perkins. If you're a Glenside patron, make sure you click the link marked Glenside in the description below, which will take you to a list of all of the books talked about during this panel, including those written by our panelists. You'll be able to see which are available as eBooks for you to check out immediately, or you'll be able to fill out a form that will tell me which books you'd like to have put on hold for you when the library is able to reopen. I hope you enjoy this panel. Um, I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their books. So whoever wants to go first, go for it. I'll start. <laughs> All right, I'm Jamie Pacton, and my book is The Life in Medieval Times of Kit. Um, it's a funny feminist um, rom-com that takes place at a medieval times type restaurant about a girl who's a wench who wants to be a knight. So it's sort of a knight's tale. Um, moxie and so one night she rides out as a knight and starts kind of a whole revolution at her restaurant in order to make things more fair and um, a bunch of her friends across the gender spectrum join her and um, they go viral with their video and this whole um, campaign of knightliness is born <laughs> so it's my book all right, I'll go. <laughs> um, so my name is Lauren Morrill and I'm the author of Better Than the Best Plan and some others. Um, and Better Than the Best Plan is about a girl who, um, her mother is kind of flighty and goes off on sort of a spiritual journey and leaves her daughter home alone. And um, her daughter is really self-sufficient, so she thinks she'll be okay, um, but Child and Family Services doesn't think so. So they come and get her to take her into foster care. And that's when she finds out that she was actually in foster care as a baby, never knew, and is going back to um, the foster mother who took care of her for the first two years of her life. Um, it sounds really heavy, <laughs> but it, it is a rom-com. There's a boy next door. <laughs> I can go next. Um, I foolishly did not plan to have a copy of my book on hand, like you all brilliantly <laughs> have, like you whip it out of nowhere. Uh, my debut is called Hearts, Strings, and Other Breakable Things, and it's an adaptation of Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, okay. which me is the one Jane Austen where the love triangle feels like a real triangle. She always has like the nice noble guy. Oh, look at you. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's it right there. Like the nice guy that you know the girl's going to get together with, and then the rake that just kind of throws a wrench in things. But what she does with Mansfield Park is the nice guy is maybe not so great. And the rake is maybe better than you think he is. So it's kind of fun to take her structure of that love triangle and bring it into a contemporary world and figure out who those characters were today. So the story has all sorts of things about class and lots of things going on with it. But ultimately, at its heart, it's about that love triangle. And, you know, who will she end up with? Big question. Read on to find out. Um, hi, I'm Marissa Cantor. I'm the author of What I Like About You. It is a rom-com that asks the question, is it still a love triangle if there are only two people in it? So 
Um, it's about a book blogger named Hallie who moves to a new town at the beginning of her senior year. She moves in with her grandfather and she um, is a pretty popular blogger, but she blogs under a pseudonym. So when she moves to this town, she runs into her best friend from the internet and she knows it's him, but he doesn't know that it's her. And for reasons that are mostly anxiety, she does not tell him who she is and kind of thinks that she can just, you know, stay away from him and like keep their internet friendship and everything will be fine. But it's a rom-com, so everything is not fine. And <laughs> as she develops feelings for him in real life, she finds out that he's in love with her online persona, thus love triangle with two people where she is both sides. Oh, uh, cool. I'm Nandini Bajpai. Uh, my book is A Match Made in Mehendi. It's about Simran Sangha, who's a 15-year-old teenager who lives in, I mean, obviously 15, uh, who lives in New Jersey. And she comes from a long line of Indian matchmakers. So her mother, her, her aunt, her grandmother, everybody has been matchmakers for generations. And she also has the talent to set people up but she's kind of opposed to joining the whole family business even though her you know her mother and her aunt would love her to join uh, but she decides to do a new spin on it uh, she takes you know the knowledge that she has from her family business and starts a dating app in her high school and that app kind of goes viral and it turns the whole social hierarchy in the high school upside down and uh, things get a little crazy from that point on, so. Awesome. Um, so the reason I was really excited to put this panel together is because I feel like fluff is usually a term that is given to sort of like the peppy contemporary starring teen girls. And it has several different connotations. Um, the most negative, I think, one is that, oh, there's just there's just no plot. It's just like, cutesy and there's romance and meh, and that's whatever um <laughs> makes me mad but um the way i like to use a, uh fluff to describe books um it's like those books that make you just like feel really good like there can still be bad things that happen inside of them but at the end of the day like you hug like you can hug it to your chest and you're like oh that just like it just leaves you with a good feeling um so what has been your experience writing books that fall into sort of that feel good category um especially since you all managed to do so while also having plots <laughs> imagine that i think that that fluff category I, I i sort of like i love happy books i love books that make me laugh Although I started out writing like dark YA fantasy and then I wrote this book after a really dark novel because I needed something lighter and I just, I wanted something funnier. Um, so when somebody called this book fluff, I was like, yeah, I'm really <laughs> excited about that label, especially because I think in this particular time in history, we could use a little fluff. Um, and yeah, but I do think it gets, you know, it's a disparaging sort of label like, oh, there's no substance to the characters or their quests or their goals. Um, and at worst, there's no plot. And I think from all the descriptions of the book I, I just heard here, I'm like, oh, I'll read every single one of those immediately. <laughs> because I like that there's, you know, there's complication, um, but there's also like, there's hardship. Like in my book, particularly Kit, you know, she's got this quest at the castle, but she's also like, her family is extremely like poor. They're working poor. And so they're, you know, they're about to lose their house and her dad's a drug addict. And so her life is complicated. And I think that that's the thing to remember, even in fluffy books, like they can make you feel good, but life is complicated. And so our characters are going through some hard times as well. And it kind of sounded like that from the other descriptions I heard here at least. So I don't know if that answers the question, but there's some thoughts on fluff. I love uh, the thought of reclaiming the term. I'm sorry, you go ahead. I'll jump in after. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you were last, last you time, so you should go for it. When yeah. to go. Uh, so, you know, the one thing I'll say is that I've, I've always been really hungry for sort of happy, fluffy books that actually had an Indian protagonist in it, because growing up in Delhi, there were no such books in English. And, um, you know, that's what we read. We read a lot of books that were set in the UK or in the US, and there were no fluffy books with Indian protagonists in it at all, or Indian American protagonists in it. They, always tend to be sort of issue books, sort of heavy books, you know, they had 
you know, pain mm-hmm. and which is fine. Those books are needed. And of course, they're very important, but it, every teenager wants to have, you know, something really happy and fun that has, you know, it's filled with sort of those sort of happy feelings that, you know, you're hungry for. And I never had that. So I always wanted to write these books and it's actually more difficult than it looks. Mm. And as I'm sure you guys will agree. And uh, so I've, that's the reason I always wanted to write the fluffy books. I love the idea of reclaiming the term fluff. You know, how do we make that positive? Because I do agree. Why do we disparage books that have more joy than hardship in them? Like once you tip the balance where you feel happy at the end, it's fluffy. If you kill somebody off at the end or somebody goes through some harrowing experience, then it's not fluffy and therefore they're sort of, it is disparaging. But um, one of the things that I love about being a writer and being in a community of writers is you realize that no one book is ever going to do anything and everything. You know, what, what we do as readers is we become a dialogue between all the different books we read. So we need the books with the hardship and the issues, but we also need the books that bring us joy. Like I had just finished reading um, Kamala Shamsi's Home Fire, which is just harrowing. I don't know how many of you guys have read that, but like mm-hmm. her brother it joins ISIS. You learn about all the torture that he learns. Like it's just one scene after another of these awful things happening. It is a brilliant and insightful novel that I want everybody to read. But as soon as I finished, I was like, I need a book where the stakes are like this. (laughs) You know people like each other and they're nice to each other and they say nice things and they do nice things. And at the end, they get to kiss each other and it's happy. Um, So what I love about being writing something that can be labeled as fluffy or joyous or whatever is that it's one book among many and it maybe balances out some of those hard things. The other thing that I really like about it is I sometimes feel like the hard stuff is easier to digest when it's digested with some fluff. So I feel like really, if you look at my book, it's filled as a rom-com, it's hopefully funny. I've got a ton of man and the man walks into a bar jokes in it. I'm a pun fanatic, like Mm -hmm. I hope it's just joyous. But at the same time, about 15% of it is me driving home points about feminism, about class, about all sorts of other things. But I feel like if I set out to write a book about feminism and class, I'd be doing it with a sledgehammer and nobody would want to read it. If I put that stuff in an entertaining novel, maybe I can sort of seep that in a little bit and still entertain you and give you a joyous way to spend some time as well. It's like cotton candy that's good for you. Yeah, <laughs> but like a little like bit comfort, of <laughs> like a comforting thing. Well, I liked what you said about how um, it's not easy. Um, Because I think when people think about, especially teen rom-coms and, oh, you know, you write fluffy books that like, oh, you just barfed it out and there's some kissing scenes and (laughs) happily ever after and then it's over, da-da. And, you know, yeah, you could do that. It wouldn't be any good. Mm -hmm. Um, And to actually write a good rom-com to get jokes that are funny and to build that chemistry and a you know, a relatable real arc and to, you know, have those earned moments of happy ending. Um, those take skill and finesse in, and, you know, there is also world building and contemporary that you have to do um, if you want your book to come alive and your setting to feel real. Um, so I feel like people say fluff and they think like, oh, it's nothing, but I write fluff and it's definitely not nothing. Yeah. <laughs> totally, yeah. Totally. And just going off what um, Nandini said about writing rom-coms with Indian American protagonists, um, what I like about you has Jewish protagonists and a Jewish cast. And so that really resonated with me because growing up, um, the only rom-coms or the only books that I read with Jewish characters were largely like Holocaust narratives. Like I didn't get to see myself in rom-coms. So um, until I read The Upside of Unrequited by Becky Albertalli, which kind of just changed my entire life. So, yeah, I think that writing the rom-coms for me was kind of like, in a similar way, like Jewish kids deserve to see themselves just getting to be kids and falling in love and not like suffering due to our collective trauma. But um, on the other side, um, I guess for me, fluff has never, I've never thought of fluff as a bad thing um, either. Um, And I think about what I wrote 
before what I like about you and I feel like they were all solidly contemporary with romantic subplots like I definitely as a teenager starting to learn how to write wrote angstier because I think I thought that that's what I had to write to be considered serious like mm -hmm. I'm a serious writer as like a 13 year old writing in my bedroom <laughs> but then I think 2016 happened and we all know like what happened mm -hmm. after and from there, I only really wanted to write things that made me happy and read things that made me happy, and those were rom coms. So that's yeah. why I wrote Kit. It was like a response to the election completely. Yeah. I keep getting asked that question in interviews. I'm like, well, here it is. We all yeah. needed that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. And uh, speaking of reading things that make you happy, um, what are some of y'all's favorite fluffy books? They don't have to be YA, they can be anything. So um, I just read. Um, Beach Read by fellow YA um, author Emily Henry, but it is adult. And I feel like I am just a one woman evangelization machine for that book because it is so well written and beautiful and hilarious and swoony. And I literally finished it and then flipped directly back to the first page and started again, which I've never done with a book ever. Um, and it was, it came at exactly the right time. And I'm probably going to read it over again soon because I just, like you said, you don't, you know, the world is terrible. So I'm going to open a book to feel good. <laughs> yeah, I panic bought so many rom-coms over the last month. Like every time I like, I like need to support an indie, let me just buy like five rom-coms at a time. I'm so excited for Beach Read. Um, one book that I'll scream about until the end of time is Today, Tonight, Tomorrow by Rachel and yes. Solomon. I was going to um, coming out Ooh, in I July. Have a <laughs> it's the best book. Enemies to Lovers 24-hour timeline. Ugh. That's awesome. It's the best. I love it so much. I just finished that book too and that was what I was going to recommend as like it's, <laughs> it's so funny. It's brilliant. I I was like taking notes on how I can like how can I learn from this book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I've just reread all my Austins. Here's my little Jane Austen <laughs> action figure. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, you know, when you're sad, there's nothing better than rereading uh, Austin. And I just watched Little Women and Emma. They're the last two movies I watched in the movie theater. And that was just, you know, it was beautiful to be able to do that. And I feel like my go-to books when I want something really happy are often stories that deal with characters' relationships with books. So like one of my favorites that I've read countless times is The Princess Bride, which we all know the story, we've at least seen the movie, mm -hmm. because it is so celebratory. I mean, that like they write off in the sun, you've got the kid rethinking his whole relationship to books. It's just joyous. The, the way the two central characters fall in love at the beginning, it's not complicated. They just love each other and we run with it. So Golden just has a way, or Goldman has a way of like, cutting through the need to make things complicated and giving us the big feelings on the page. And there's something that I really, really enjoy about that. I've read Jamie's book, so I feel like I can push that a little bit for you. It was an absolute delight. Um, again, it's characters that you, it's characters you want to spend time with, right? You know, we sort of think of it as fluff, but I sometimes think they're characters you root for in the context of the safety, knowing they're going to be okay at the end. That's one of the things that I actually love about the rom-com format. You don't go in going like, oh my God, is one of these characters yeah. going to die by the end? Is something awful mm -hmm. going to happen? Like you get the kind of setup, you start rooting for the characters and then you get to read with this like, this joy, this kind of propulsion toward knowing there's going to be something joyous. And there's, a, there's just something that I love about spending my time that way. Again, mm -hmm. balancing it off with the other stuff too. I need the hard mm -hmm. stuff. But sometimes I just want to go on that ride that I know is going to go uphill at some point. Yeah. Have you read the Thursday Next books? Yeah, those are, those are a blast. I love those for just books that celebrate books, you know. And yeah. Just, um, yeah. Um, so we sort of already covered what was going to be my third question, which is talking about like why it's so important to have joy on bookshelves. So I'm going to um, actually add another question that I did not send you guys. Um, <laughs> because once again, that whole idea uh, that pe some people have that fluff means no plot um, really makes me mad. Um, and what I like about all of these books is that there are very strong internal and external conflicts. Um, and 
some of these conflicts arise from things that are self-created. I like with Marissa's book where it's a love triangle where she's both sides. Um, or Kit where she's like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this decision and I'm gonna do this thing. And then she's like dealing with the repercussions of it while trying to fight for the thing she's wanted no matter what, like stuff like that. Um, and so did you guys want to talk about like the way you chose to set up the conflict within your story um, and how much that changed from your initial idea of what your book was going to be? Um, well, so Better Than the Best Plan actually started out much darker because um, I was like, I had written four YA rom-coms before that and I was like, I'm going to try something serious. <laughs> um, and I sent it to my editor and she called me and she's like, this is good. Um, but it doesn't sound like you at all. <laughs> um, it sounds like you're wearing clothes that don't fit. Um, and I think we should re-examine it. Um, and I was like, and as soon as she said that, I was, yeah, it made total sense. And all the ideas to fix it just came pouring out. Um, and I found that I was still able to have the core conflict, which is, you know, I, my main character has gone to live with this foster mother. It's a much better situation than what she grew up with. But if she wishes that she'd had that foster mother all along, it would be wishing away her mother, who even though she was difficult, she does love. And so like you were saying, like it takes a really difficult thing and that remains, but everything around it gets funny and hijinksy and heart eyes and all of those things. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. I got, I got lost in my train of thought, but <laughs> my brain is jello. I haven't used it in, I think, like, yeah. weeks. <laughs> you know, talking about um, how things change from the first idea you had about the book to how it finally ended up uh, in, in Match, um, I did a lot of, uh, initially I had a lot of stuff about, uh, you know, the different generations and how they all looked at love and I had a matchmaker's log. Uh, I'm sorry, this is my cat. Biggie. Oh. <laughs> uh, Hi, Biggie. Hi. Oh. Uh, so, um, so initially I had sort of a matchmaker's log that her grandmother and her mother and her great grandmother had kept like through all the different years. So there were matches being set up in 1920s Punjab and there were matches being set up in 1980s Delhi and then there were matches being set up, you know. So it was like a matchmaker's log and there was all this stuff about the generations and how, you know, love had changed but not as much as you would think. But then in the end, we decided to go with more of the high school plot, you know, the whole hijinksy fun, you know, and uh, it, it was fine, it was great, but a bit of me still wishes that we had some of those elements. You can't have everything. Can you go back and write that as an adult novel? Because I would read that like tomorrow. That yeah. Sounds amazing. Thank you. Yeah, sounds so good. Um, I guess I'll speak to the idea that there's no plot. I love romance novels. I love romance novels so much and I get so um, annoyed and irritated when they get sort of lumped under this there's no plot and some of them don't have a plot but I think some of the best work being done I would boldly say in fiction today is happening in the adult contemporary romance genre like there's interesting things going on you know that like Helen Huang is doing and other I mean just just so many interesting exciting books that are you know I mean I I always think of the kiss quotient and what she did for our autistic characters and I have an autistic son. And so, you know, like what she did for the notion that, you know, someone with autism can't fall in love or can't, you know, engage in this relationship. And um, it's a perfectly fluffy, beautiful book and it's, you know, funny and um, it's got everything a romance needs, but it's also got a plot that's pushed, that's working through some deep ideas. And so I think it's such a disservice to say that, um, a funny book or a fluffy book can't have a plot and like also we need plots to move our books forward yeah. um, and so in every one of these I mean with Kit like Kit's plot was pretty straightforward from the beginning and that's been the, the gift of this book because I tend to like I can write two acts and then by the characters are just kind of hanging out and like Oh, that thing that happened at the midpoint? Wow, that was exciting. Let's go get coffee. Um, but with Kit, it was just like she had to keep pushing, you know, to become a knight. Um, and that was lucky. But yeah, I, I, I have nothing but rage when I hear that fluffy books don't have plots because <laughs> of course they do, you know? And yeah. 
we, or you also hear that it's not that they don't have plots. It's that like, well, you didn't have to come up with the plot because it all ends the same way. And there's something to be said for, you know, you see male authors all the time out there being like, I'm breaking all the rules and reinventing the genre. And you're like, hey, how about I worked within the constraints, but made it something totally new. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, there are all these incredible romance authors right now who are working within this framework that's existed for time immemoria and yet taking you to a totally new place. Um, and I think that takes more skill and talent than, you know, tossing out the, the rule book and, you know, being a creative genius or whatever they say they're doing. <laughs> well, right. It's this harmful notion of the great American novel and this whole like, yeah. Wait, mm -hmm. Should we name names here? <laughs> certain, <laughs> certain authors we might all be thinking of from certain Twitter threads that, you know, have this notion of like, literature with a capital L and I have a master's in literature so I've studied this I spent a lot of time reading these kinds of books um and it, it's just it's harmful to readers like I you know to... and I think there's also like a parallel between romance and YA and like the same conversations happening like that's yeah. what made me that's what it just made me think of about like that even us just writing like YA rom-coms that's even like another notch down to some people from yeah. because they're they're for teenagers so they're they're for but you know, it's funny before this label why it existed there were so many books about young people you know the catcher in the rye and little women they were young people in those books and you know now you can call it why and suddenly it's not as good as it should be it doesn't make any sense to me it's always been the story that people wanted to tell. It's always been one of the big stories that be the coming of age novel. Yeah. Well, and then you also hear a lot of people talking about, well, teenagers don't read. And it's like, well, maybe it's because you're treating reading for teenagers as work. And I'm treating reading for teenagers as entertainment and fun. Like exactly. I, yeah. I write to make you happy, to entertain you, um, not for you to take your medicine. And maybe if there are some things in there that you get out of it on top of that that's wonderful but that's not they're not morality tales and i'm not trying to teach you a lesson um reading is fun yeah. <laughs> and maybe maybe if your teenager doesn't think so you need to reevaluate what message you're sending about what reading is totally and you, you see those same conversations like anytime dave filthy's books come up right like i've got a kid who loves dog man with a passion that is you know like and he will listen to you know every single wings of fire book and my job like my role has just been to get out of his way and give him the books yeah. he wants and he's a great little reader you know he just doesn't sit down and read like heavy middle grade because that's not his thing you know and he has kind of a, a challenging life with his brother and things like that and so yeah let teens read what they want and don't treat it as work you know let them reread what they want if they yeah. want to read it over again that's fine <laughs> I think one of the things I've always balked at at the idea that romance is a lesser genre is I feel like what is less or what is more important than the way people relate to and care for each other? Like, why do we think of that as a lesser plot line? And what novel with a bigger plot line doesn't ultimately come down to that? I mean, like Lord of the Rings, that whole trilogy is about how those characters relate to each other and how they treat each other. Oh my God, sure. it's the romance novel. <laughs> <laughs> like it's totally the romance novel um but like there are huge things happening and characters die and they're fighting orc armies but ultimately we read that book for how those characters bond with each other on their journey yeah. so why do we think that a book that focuses on the bond between those characters is lesser than a book that puts a whole bunch of other stuff in front of that you know my book to sort of get to your question about kind of how things change and all that as you're working on the the piece I workshop part of Heartstrings in a writing class, and the consensus was basically the romance can exist, but it needs to be the B plot. The A plot has to be something else. So I had this whole book after it went through draft after draft where the romance was very much the B plot, and there was this whole plot about this girl who wanted to be a musician, which is still in there, but now that's the B plot, and the romance is the A plot. And ultimately, it changed because my editor was like, the scenes we want to read are the romance scenes. They're not the scenes about her wanting to be a musician. We've read that over and over. It's the scenes about how the characters are connecting to each other or how they're not connecting to each other. That's what's making us turn the page, not whether or not she's gonna get on stage with her guitar. 
So I did find it fascinating that, yeah, in the context of trying to speak critically about writing and what is literary and what is fiction and these sort of big questions, there was a feeling that romance had to play a supporting role. Once it came down to just a fundamental conversation about what do we want to spend our time with on the page, what is connecting the reader to the story, the idea that the romance itself was actually the most central thing came to the, came to the top. And that's been a fantastic just journey for me as a writer to be able to embrace that and not fight that, to not feel like I have to put the orc army out there, I have to put this other plot in there. If it serves the character's growth, by all means it goes in there. And there's always going to be a landscape of lots of things going on in any book. There's never just one thing happening. We wouldn't get through 80,000 words with just one thing happening. Yeah. Um, but allowing that central relationship to really take focus um, and embracing that has just been sort of an exciting journey as a writer. And you know, the one thing I'll say is people always seem to assume that fluff is only for girls. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, you know, honestly, that's so not true. I think boys can read that as well and they should read that as well. It'll give them a better, you know, understanding of human nature. And that is so important, how to build your relationships, all that stuff. I don't understand why it's always sort of, you know, positioned as a girl book or a boy book and fluff is always, you know, romance is always meant for the girls. That's not... Yeah, yeah. when you're asking these questions of like, why is romance thought of as less than, it's the answer is because like women consume it. Like it, the answer is, is sexism. Yeah, exactly. Like that, that's that's basically it, and it's the bummer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think it's changing. I, I really yeah. do. Like I was. I, I think you. I I'm I'm writing an article about this right now about like romance as a feminist space and how mm -hmm. it can be reclaimed and how. But but you're right. It's so insidious that 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 term fluffy is like oh those are the books that women read and that's. I don't know, is that Victorian? Like that just, I don't know where that notion comes from, but. I mean, it's a human experience, right? right. Yeah. Love is a human experience. Exactly. Right? Um, so one of the things I always have been thinking a lot about um, is that sometimes when like awards roll around, you know, it seems like art becomes this race to see who could make their characters the most miserable. And that's especially true. Like that's why I never, have ended up seeing any of the Oscar nominated movies except for the animated ones. Yeah. Um, and so one of my favorite turnarounds on that is um, in Monsters Inc. Because they spend the whole movie trying to scare people and powering them with the miserableness and then they discover that laughter is actually like 10 times more powerful. Um, and so I thought that fit in really well with the idea of this yeah. panel. So do you have any favorite jokes? or like a punny tagline <laughs> for your book and it's okay if the answer is no I have a couple I mean uh, my next book is called is a I always call it hashtag pizza romcom um but the title is it's kind of a cheesy love story it takes place at a pizza place um and I threw that title out on a whim and my editor immediately was like yeah that's it that, that's what we're calling, it's kind of a cheesy love story. Like that's what, we're gonna tell you what it is and you're gonna get it, love it. Um, so that made me very happy and there's pizza on the cover. <laughs> so my next book is not a rom-com um, and I'm actually struggling with this because Kit has been branded so heavily as this like fun, jaunty rom-com. Um, and my next book is also funny and heartfelt. Um, but it's kind of an anti-rom-com because it's about a girl who's just broken up with the guy she was with for two years and he kind of like left her. And so she's, in addition to winning $58 million in the lottery and this whole big A plot, she's trying to figure out like, how do you say goodbye to your first love? So it's like completely the opposite, but I still hope fluffy. Um, but I, I would be so interested to hear from all of you about like the book after this one and are you living in that sort of fluffy rom-com space because I'm not and I'm really struggling with it mm -hmm. in terms of swag and branding and my own process um, but I do have a joke and then I'll <laughs> stop talking my son my nine-year-old made this up and I thought it was great um, so my book has got lots and lots of fun puns anything to do with joust so like joust do it and it's joust about time um, but the joke is this we've been making a lot of bread lately because of pandemic um, and so and we watch a lot of bake show because my autistic son <laughs> loves the bake show. Anyways, what does Kit Sweetly and um, this loaf of bread that you're making um, have in common? 
but they've both got a lot to prove. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. I'm done with jokes. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So um, I have two things. So in What I Like About You, um, my main character is a book blogger. And while I was going through revisions um, during Pitch Wars, I worked with Rachel Solomon and we were like, this blog needs more of a theme. It needs a thing. So there's a lot of cupcakes in my book now because of that. And like my character is a baker and we decided to call the blog thanks to Rosie Thor, um, pun master, uh, one true pastry um, as a play on like one true pairing. Mm -hmm. So that's my, that's my book pun and what I like about you. My second book, which hasn't been like officially announced yet, but it's very, um, I say if what I like about you is my love letter to reading and YA, then my second book is a love letter to theater. And the title that I had been calling it, which isn't the official title, so I feel like I can say it. Um, but for like the year I was drafting it, I was calling it One Play More. And that just made me like, oh. <laughs> happy. So I don't have a joke, but you know, uh, the next book that is in the works is definitely Fluffy. So I'm very happy about that and not official yet. So I can't really talk about it, but you know, definitely Fluffy. <laughs> That's a good title for a book. Like, <laughs> I know. Definitely, definitely Fluffy. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I don't, I don't feel like I have a good joke. I was trying to come up with something because my book is rife with jokes. I mean, everybody's favorite scene, there's a fake makeout scene where all they're doing is telling man in a bar jokes the whole time. Everybody thinks they're getting it on, but they're just like cracking jokes one after the other. So I feel like I can say, you know, man walked into a bar, met a girl. Like that would be the, the you know, hashtag on mine. Um, but I did want to mention, just because I think your, uh, your reference to Monsters, Inc. Have you guys all seen Preston Sturgis' Sullivan's Travels? Or am I the only one here who's seen that? <laughs> um, it's this fantastic movie. Preston Sturgis is a comic genius. If you're looking for banter inspiration between romantic pairings, amazing. Um, and Sullivan's Travels basically follows a guy who, he's a film writer and director who writes these just really hard films that are digging into issues. And it's like, this is what I need to do. And I need to change the world and write all these hard issues things and tell everybody what's going on in the world. And he goes on this journey to try to find out, it's American, so he tries to find out in America, like what's, what's really at issue here and what are people struggling with? And he ends up at a prison. And at the prison, they're showing this like comic cartoon and he watches everybody break into laughter. And what his sort of arc is to realize, just like in Monsters, Inc., right? Like, this idea of bringing joy to people has deep, deep value to our world. We don't have to use everything in our lives to try to teach people. Bringing joy is, is innate in, in value of itself. So it's just, it's a good reference point. And like I say, if you've not seen Preston Sturgis, just to get, get that banter, it's also in those like 30s, 40s films, you know how fast that banter wins. So it's just like line, 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 line. It's amazing getting that chemistry between the characters. So Huge recommender of Preston Sturgis for everybody who writes rom-coms and then checking out <laughs> Sullivan's Travels just for that sort of arc of learning to embrace what is joyous and fluffy and brings laughter for its own value. Nice. I stole my jokes from my sister. Um, so I've got, I'm reading a book about anti-gravity. It's impossible to put down. <laughs> And then this oh, I have to tell you one oh, that this, yeah. this, this is one that my five-year-old is obsessed with because he loves SpongeBob SquarePants. Oh, excellent. And <laughs> when he went to his little like kindergarten entrance interview, somebody, the principal offhandedly was like, do you know any jokes? And he goes, yeah, I do. I was like, oh no. But it's why, let's see, why did the kid get into the pirate movie? Because it was rated R. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> um, my sister's favorite one, though, is what do we want? Low flying airplane noises. When do we want them? Meow. <laughs> <laughs> you know who always has really good jokes is um, Jennifer Smith. Every panel I've ever done with her, she always has like the perfect dad joke to tell at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. One that she always tells is, um, why did the scarecrow win an award? For being outstanding in his field. 
Pretty <laughs> <laughs> <Are they> good. <laughs> so good. Okay, I've got one last question that I also did not send you guys ahead of time, but that was because I wanted it to be a surprise. So if your main character was going to have a big, like, rom-com moment that has, like, from a rom-com you've seen, so it has to be, like, something that's actually happened, like, boombox moment, uh, Ferris wheel and Love, Simon, like, whatever, something you've seen, if they were going to have one of those specific moments, what do you think it would be? So mine would have to come out of a Bollywood movie. Great. We love and it. <laughs> so two choices. One is rain scene. They always have this rain, dance in the rain, you know, so somehow it's all very romantic. And the second one is you chase after a train, you know, someone is leaving on the train and somebody else is sort of slow motion running and you know has to grab on and get on the train so one or the other one or the other has to be in there my favorite rom-com is bridget jones i like my sister and i watched that i don't know it's not without its problems but um the 90s were a strange time so i can certainly see kit running down the street and like she's forgotten her pants and she's going to get the guy in the snow remember that one at the very end and there's the umbrella and he's like what are you doing you're ridiculous She's a little bit of a hot mess as well. So I could see that if I was going to go with an iconic rom-com moment. I think that I would want someone to sing to Hallie the way that E. Fletcher sings to Julia Stiles in 10 Things I Hate About You. <laughs> it's the best. It's so hard. <laughs> no. It's my tricky, favorite, right? Like, I feel like I put the big moments in the book. So, <laughs> right. like, it's full of grand gestures and chasing after the bus and the, you know, like the big, the big, he, he, this is how I feel moments and the creating art for each other moments. Like, it's all sort of in there without giving too much away. Um, but I think that's one of the things that we love about these uh, kind of quintessential rom coms that stay with us, particularly in the YA field. Um, I mean, I'm hardly a teenager anymore, but still that, that fantasy of the grand gesture, right? The reality, a reality of a grand gesture is very different from the fantasy of a grand gesture, mm -hmm. right? Like if somebody really showed up at your house with a boom box or really like started singing to you in the stadium, you'd be like, mm, I don't know about this. This is a little uncomfortable. But within the context of a fantasy, these moments work so well because they're just this explosion of emotion and feeling that we don't really tend to experience it the same way in real life. And that's one of the joys of having fiction and having fantasy and having escape is that we can sort of live in that grand scale. So I love all of those moments, like all of those just huge grand gesture moments in, in rom-coms, whether it's, yeah, Sandra Bullock chasing uh, Hugh Grant down the street or Bridget Jones chasing Darcy down the street, like all of those, you know, the, the kisses in the rain, the dance scenes, the serenades, like all of it is fabulous. Um, but I think one of the reasons I love those grand moments is because I'm so aware that they exist in the context of the stories that they're in. Okay, so <clears throat> I thought of one, it's not a movie. Um, I'm okay. gonna go with my favorite TV show, Gilmore Girls. Oh. And um, so my next book, I haven't read this book in like a year and a half. <laughs> I never read it after it's in our form. So I kind of don't remember what's in it at times. So I'm going to go with my new book, which, um, it's kind of a cheesy love story. And I think the you jump, I jump Jack, um, scene from with Logan and Rory and the, um, life and death brigade jumping off the thing. Um, that I, was so I could, awesome. yeah, I think I could see my main character and, um, and the pizza delivery guy <laughs> having that moment. Awesome. Um, so can we just sort of re go down the line? Um, just reiterate your name, your book, and um, where people can find you online. All right. My name is Lauren Morrill. My book is Better Than the Best Plan, and you can find me on Instagram at Lauren Morrill. I'm Jamie Pacton. My book is The Life and Medieval Times of Kit Sweetly. And you can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Jamie Pacton. And it's J-A-M-I-E-P-A-C-T-O-N. Okay, I'll go. Um, I'm Marissa Cantor. I'm the author of What I Like About You. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Marissa Cantor. Marissa with one S and Cantor with a K. 
Okay. All right. So I'm Nandini Bajpai, and my book is A Match Made in Mendy. And you can find me, um, you know, on Twitter and Instagram. Probably easiest to go to nandinibajpai.com, and that is spelled N-A-N-D-I-N-I. B A J P A I dot com. I'm Jacqueline Ferkins. My novel is Hearts, Strings, and Other Breakable Things. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at JF, my initials, Kills Darlings, because I spend more time cutting things from my books than adding <laughs> things to my books. Awesome. Thank you all so much for doing this.